Hello everyone! In this video, we're going to prepare an agar solution to be used in mycology study. I wanted to demonstrate for anyone just starting out in the field how I go about sterilizing and then dispensing small batches of agar into petri dishes. This will be a home science based video so we aren't going to need an autoclave or a pressure cooker. I've been using this method for about 6 years and the results are pretty dependable and pretty positive. Enjoy! Let's get familiar with all the chemicals, apparatus, and materials we'll be using. More details on these later. Beginning with distilled water, a flat bottom boiling flask with rubber stopper, a magnetic stir bar, and a magnetic stir hot plate combo, two kitchen timers, an electronic scale, a small beaker for weighing, some sodium hydroxide solution, light malt extract powder, nutrient agar powder, universal indicator paper, some tweezers, a mortar, along with its pestle, lab quality malt extract agar, activated carbon, a 100 milliliter graduated cylinder, a cheap hot plate I got at Walmart for 10 bucks, a 250 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask with rubber stopper, a glass stir rod, there's also a small flask of hydrochloric acid I forgot to point to, and we'll also be using the scupula I'm currently holding. I'll be doing two simultaneous batches to demonstrate different budget setups, so there's more than you'd usually be dealing with. First, clear an area to work. That's better. Focus camera? There. Measure out 125 milliliters of distilled water using your graduated cylinder and pour this into our boiling flask atop the stirrer hot plate. Don't forget to add the stir bar. Plug the flask opening with a rubber stopper and weigh out 6.3 grams of our lab quality malt extract agar powder. I like using lab quality materials if I want to eliminate as many variables as possible. This first batch and setup will obviously be the more expensive route, but it is very convenient and reliable. Pour the agar powder into the distilled water, but don't turn on heating. Restop her and set aside. Get ready to do another weighing and grab the Erlenmeyer flask. The agar I'll be using in this batch is nutrient agar, which is just what you'd use if you're culturing bacteria or yeast. We also need some light malt extract powder so the fungi will have some food. Weigh out 3.1 grams of the agar and then measure out 2.5 grams of the malt extract. 2.7 grams? Yeah, close enough. Measure out another 125 milliliters of distilled water and pour into the Erlenmeyer flask. Pour the agar as well as the malt extract powder into the flask and stir to incorporate. Grab the mortar and pestle along with the activated carbon. Transfer some carbon into the mortar. The exact amount isn't crucial. This needs to be pulverized into as fine a powder as possible. So we crush. And crush. And crush. Oh what, you thought you were done grinding? That's cute. Start adding the carbon to our agar solution and stir until a very black mixture is obtained. More on the use of carbon shortly. Wash down the sides of the flask and then place on the burner. Turn on heating for both of our setups and then get our timers ready. Realize you forgot to take a pH reading and turn the heat back off. Then you have to dunk a strip of indicator paper into the agar. You can see the boiling flask's pH looks to be a little acidic. We'll adjust this shortly. Grab another strip of pH paper and use that to measure the agar in the Erlenmeyer flask. Add a few drops of a sodium hydroxide solution to raise the pH and recheck the level with our paper. I actually overshoot and make the agar too basic, so a small dose of hydrochloric acid is required. Recheck the pH. Seems to be between 8 and 9. Perfect for terrestrial wild mushroom cultures from the areas I hunt. Set everything up on its corresponding labware and turn on heating for both hot plates. Now we just have to wait for everything to come to a boil. Wash down the walls of the boiling flask and restop her. Stir the mixture in the Erlenmeyer flask and keep an eye on it. This batch will require a lot of tending, but it's doable. You 
can already see the cheap hot plate setup requires much more hands-on attention than the more advanced setup. Move the cheap burner around to make sure we're not going to cause a fire. Yeah, we're good. Now you can see here that the cheap hot plate does heat up faster than the lab hot plate, so a 60 minute timer is initiated. Unfortunately though, this isn't a very even or a controllable heat source, and it's pretty easy for everything to boil over in this setup. But just watch the heat and stir with the glass rod. You'll be fine. We're now at the point where the setup on the left is pretty much on autopilot, so that means we can focus most of our attention to the setup on the right, which is good because it requires frequent stirring and frequent heat adjustments. Now that everything seems to be chugging along nicely, let's talk more in depth of why I chose to use these specific materials and apparatus. Firstly, why two separate simultaneous batches? Well, I thought it would be a good visual to demonstrate how different a procedure can be when comparing lab materials. The lab hot plate stirrer combo is much more efficient and easier to control than the Walmart source burner. Unfortunately, it is also over 10 times the cost. I believe my lab hot plate was around 130 US dollars, so it is an entry level piece of equipment, but you can see just how convenient and useful it really is. You could get a more expensive burner from the store, but to get the level of control you can get with a lab hot plate, you need something with a variable heating element. Most cheap burners like this are either on or off during the heating cycle, making it very difficult to control your heat source. The lab hot plate, however, is linear heat. If you turn the knob to full, you get maximum temperature, but if you turn it to half, you get half of your maximum heat as you'd expect. And in all honesty, if you're going to look for a kitchen burner that can do this, you may as well spring the extra 40 bucks for a hot plate stirrer combo. That said, there's nothing wrong with using cheaper equipment. Everybody's budget will be different and everyone has to start out somewhere. Let's talk about the agar used in both of these demonstrations. The lab grade malt extract agar is very convenient and easy to use. It's also more expensive than mixing up your own solution with nutrient agar and light malt extract powder. I can't remember the exact costs, but I think it computes to a savings of around 50%. Now potato dextrose is another popular nutrient source for mycology, but my potato dextrose agar is in very bad shape, and I don't really trust it to be used in this example. So I went with the malt extract instead. I may do another video later where I extract the dextrose from fresh potatoes and use that as a fungi's food source, but for now, this method works great. Another question you probably have is why did I add carbon to the one on the right? And to be honest, this is mostly for aesthetics. I like the looks of mushroom mycelium as well as bacteria and yeast colonies on black agar. But it does potentially have some practical purposes. For one, we don't have hands-free stirring for this batch. The larger chunks of carbon that are added will sink to the bottom and kind of act like boiling chips basically give the solution more surface area to form bubbles and have a more controlled boil. The carbon might also, in theory, absorb any toxins present in the agar solution itself. And I've also noticed that adding carbon seems to help control the pH to a point. Speaking of pH, there are many sources that say to shoot for a pH of neutral, or 7. Now, I like this pH level for already established cultures, but for wild mushroom samples, I've noticed they grow better on slightly alkaline agar, at least for first generation clones. Malt extract does seem to impart a slight acidity to the solution, so I do recommend investing in some cheap indicator paper, but it isn't absolutely critical. As long as the pH isn't too high or too low, you should be fine. The clear agar solution was given a pH of around eight, maybe eight and a half, and the black agar was already at a pretty much neutral pH of seven. It should probably be stated that if your goal is to just grow bacteria, yeasts, or molds, you don't need the malt extract powder. Just follow the mixing directions on your nutrient agar and carry out the procedure exactly as it is shown. Let's talk about sterilization now. Ideally, you would mix up your agar and then put that into a pressure cooker or an autoclave to completely sterilize everything. But these are costly and cumbersome. I found that if you do smaller batches, to a maximum volume of about 250 milliliters of the agar solution, be careful about contamination, and boil the agar for about an hour, you can achieve very good results. That's what Louis Pasteur did for the nutrient broth in his swan neck flask experiment, and it works splendidly. However, if you are doing larger batches of agar, a pressure cooker is highly recommended. 
You can notice how we still have to constantly baby the flask on the right. It's sensitive. I haven't had a boil over yet in this video, but I've come very close a few times. Now this isn't ideal because it dispenses agar on the walls of the container, and those parts may not get the full brunt of the heat. These could be potential contamination sources, but hopefully by placing a stopper on top, letting the steam condense and roll down the walls and wash down into the flask, we kill any organisms hanging out on the sides. And hopefully, the stopper isn't a source of contamination in and of itself. Oh well, it is what it is. I think we'll be okay though. Look how little we've had to do to the flask on the left. It really has been on autopilot for almost an hour. It just demonstrates how well these lab hot plates work. Even a cheap one like this. The stopper was loosely placed on top, and the steam generated inside reached in equilibrium long ago. The weight of the stopper allows the flask to build a very slight pressure, yet still vent steam when needed to avoid catastrophic boilover. All we really had to do with the round flask once it reached boiling was top off with distilled water every now and then to account for evaporation loss. I don't like adding any water after the 40 minute mark in case there are microbes present in the water you're introducing. So be sure you're happy with your end volume when you have about 20 minutes left of boiling. Okay, the flask on the right is done boiling. So we take it off the heat, ouch, and remove the burner from frame. There we go. Lay down some paper towel and place the flask on top. Spray with bleach. I shouldn't have done this yet. Get a pair of gloves and a procedure mask, and wait for the flask on the left to get done boiling. There, finally done boiling. So we move the whole setup out of the way, and turn off the heating, and then we turn off the stirring. Put down more paper towels, and grab your bleach box. At least that's what I call this thing. Put on your gloves and mask. Give all the surfaces of the bleach box a good spray down with bleach based cleaner and wash with a paper towel. Spray your hands with the cleaner or alcohol. Place your sterile petri dishes in the box and rub bleach all over the bag they came in. Sanitize a pair of scissors to open the bag of petri dishes. Position your action camera in the bleach box for a really cool close up of agar pour. And then immediately screw up by not pressing record. Carefully open your petri dishes and try not to jostle things too much. Transfer your flask to the box, and spray again with bleach. Then, remove the rubber stopper. Grab the lid of the bottom petri dish, and lift it along with all the other dishes on top. Then, quickly fill with the agar solution. Keep repeating until you're out of agar or petri dishes. Place your filled dishes on a clean surface so you have room to pour in the next batch. Or move on to the next step if you're just on one batch, like a normal person. And now I'm just going to do the same exact thing for these other dishes. Grab some kind of container that your petri dishes will fit into and clean it out with bleach. Then just carefully place them inside. I also put some leftover dishes I made up about four months ago in here. They really will last a while if they're properly prepared and stored. Cover the top of the container with a lid, plastic wrap, paraffin, whatever. Press and seal is my personal favorite. Transfer to a level surface and allow to cool down naturally. Do not put these in the fridge. And that is pretty much it. Let them cool overnight and you should be good to go. I like to let petri dishes sit for a few days before I use them in case of contaminants, but realistically you can start using these within 24 hours. I'll be sure to do a video on how I do mushroom clones and propagate mushroom spores on dishes, and I'll probably also do a beginner's video on how to do culture swabs and how to grow bacteria and the like on agar. But that's all for now. I hope this video was informative and enjoyable to you. Thank you for watching.